Welcome back to the History of Electronic Drums, Episode 2. But first, here are a few additions and corrections from Episode 1. Somewhere around 1973, Carl Palmer of the band Lake and Palmer used an early electronic drum integration into his acoustic drum set. Here's how he described that setup in an interview. So the synthesizer was eight individual cigar box sized synthesizers. Each one had a designated sound, which could be changed by a mitigator on the floor up an octave or down. There was a microphone located to each drum as the triggering mechanism for the synthesizer cigar box. It was made by a gentleman named Nick Rose. Nick worked for ELP. Because I had nothing electric going on at the time, I had him build me something. Here's a little bit of rock and roll trivia for you. One of the very first um, electronic drum solos ever recorded was on an album by Mr. Lake of Palmer. I had the first of the electronic drums, which I had made for me personally in England. Another early pioneer of electronic drums is Jim Mothersbaugh from the band Devo, based out of Ohio. He created an early homemade electronic drum set. His brother Mark had this to say. In the early 70s, my brother Jim, who played drums for me, I said, Jim, I want the sound of V2 rockets and mortar blasts and, and helicopter noises for, for drum sounds. And there was no such thing like that available at the time. And he put together one of the first drum kits ever that was electronic. In a separate interview for Sound on Sound, he had this to say. He invented one of the first electronic drum kits. It was like 1972 or 1973. On his very first electronic drum set that he built, he had acoustic drums, took guitar pickups and glued them onto the heads, and ran that through a wah pedal, a fuzz pedal, and an echo box, and then put that into an amp on stage. So he'd sit there and he'd have one foot on the kick, and the hi-hats would be totally closed, but it would be going through a wah pedal, so he'd use the filter on the mic going into the wah pedal, to make an open and closed hi-hat, and he could get all this articulation on it. It was really crude and it was really scary sounding. I don't think I've ever heard anything quite like what his drum kit sounded like back in those days. It was a little bit out of control. Sometimes by going into this echoplex and trying to work it while he was playing with the band, it would start regenerating to the point where he couldn't stop it on stage. He'd have to completely stop playing so he could turn off the echoplex. Jim got so obsessed with electronics that he stopped playing in the band and he just started modifying all of our gear. He was kind of an early circuit bender. We'd take toys and he'd figure out a way to put quarter inch jacks into them so we could plug them into an amp. And he'd do things to the circuitry. One final thing to note about Jim Mothersbaugh is the fact that he apparently worked for Roland at one point as well. And finally, a quick thing to note about the Moog 1130 drum controller. It is not 100% clear what the body of that drum was actually made of. In the book Electronic Drum Facts by Alex Graham, it is said that the shell is made by Pearl. Meanwhile, in the book The Drum, A History by Matt Dean, he claims that it was a Ludwig shell. And the truth appears to be somewhere in the middle. A commenter in the last video claims it was first built using Ludwig shells and then later Pearl shells in the late 70s. That makes the most sense to me, so that's where I'll leave it. All right, on to episode two of the history of electronic drums. It quite simply brings drums into the 80s. Welcome to Dynacord the creator of the digital drum computer system. 1984, Dynacord hits the scene with the Dynacord digital drum kit with the price of about 550 pounds, which I believe is just for the pads. These earlier drums from Dynacord featured a five-sided drum pad design. The snare and toms were 13 inches across and the kick drum was 20 inches across. Dynacord was one of those early adopters going with drum samples instead of synthesizer drum brains. There were a few different drum brains for this kit. There was the Picuter and the Picuter S variant. The only difference is that they added independent pitch knobs for each of the eight channels. The whole system was cartridge based using 28 pin chips. So if you wanted a different sound, you'd literally have to change out the chip for that particular pad input, like a cartridge on a video game console. You could also sample your own sounds, which was a pretty big deal at the time. If you wanted to do that, you'd have to buy the Dynacord Boomer unit for an extra 300 pounds. The initial idea was that you wouldn't actually buy one yourself. Instead, music stores that were dealers for Dynacord would have a boomer unit on hand. You would bring in a snare or whatever you wanted to record the sound into into the music store. You'd pay them 25 bucks and they would burn a new cartridge for you. Then all you'd have to do is put that cartridge into your Picuter drum brain and you were off to the races. The sampled sounds had a cap at a one second long duration, which unfortunately was not long enough for realistic cymbal sustain, but maybe was okay for kick, snare, and tom sounds. The Picuter sound module was made to interface with Dynacord's big brain sequencer. In 1984, the company Cat Inc. was founded by Bill Kotoski. He brought over his experience from working on the Star Instruments Snare MP and actually bought the rights to that product after Star Instruments faded away. If you remember, the Snare MP was going to be a MIDI percussion controller, but it was announced and never actually came out. The company was very small in the early days, 
Cat Inc. was just Bill and his wife Maria. They would soon also bring on a man named Mario. The Cat MIDI Percussion Controller was released as their first product. That name was later updated to the Mallet Cat the very next year. The whole concept of an electronic Mallet controller was so new, in fact MIDI itself was brand new, that the first few years of the company were spent explaining to drummers why a MIDI percussion controller as a concept could be so useful. The giant that was Simmons would soon come out with a competing product called the Silicon Mallet around a year or so later. Bill actually saw this as helpful though. In an interview that he did back in the 80s, he mentioned that the humongous Simmons advertising budget helped propel the entire concept of MIDI percussion controllers into public awareness. These were definitely bootstrapping days at Cat Inc. back in 1984. The call center was at Bill's house, the phone being manned by his wife Maria, while Bill worked a separate day job. In an interview that he did back in March of 1992 for Modern Drummer magazine, Bill said, I'd come home and she'd say, there's some guy from Canada that called today. I think his name was uh, uh, Neil P-E-A-R-T. There'd be these little breakthroughs. In 1984, Digiplay came out with the EDS 800 kit, which was originally called the Hits kit. The module was sold as an upgrade over the old one, this time with small circular pads. In 1984, Bias released a successor to their first drum set, the EXD and also the EXD2. They ditched the more acoustic looking look of their first drum set and switched over to a more conventional electronic-y looking six-sided drum pad setup. They would later also release the EXD3 module, which gave drummers five extra sound controls over each pad for all five channels. And finally, there was also a rack mounted variant and the MXD1 MIDI interface released. In 1984, m and released the K2 drum set. This new version is easy to tell apart from the old triangle version, because this time, instead of going with rounded edges, they just chopped them off instead. And it just looks better in my opinion. The new line came in a couple of different variants. There was the K27D and the K25D. The last number signified how many pads came with the drum set. The pricing for these drum sets was 870 pounds and 780 pounds respectively. In the same year, parent company Magic Music had a change of heart. They rightly decided that M&A just wasn't a cool enough name for an electronic drum company, so they changed it over to Ultimate Percussion. This name change coincided with a new drum set, the UP5, which sold for about 550 pounds. This time the company went with a rack mounted design for the drum module and it had a smaller screen. The drum pads were now thicker and came in black or white with a new logo on them. Ultimate Percussion also came out with the K2X that year with a really cool looking drum module. In 1984, Clone also came out with a new product called the Clone Dual Percussion Synthesizer. It came with two drum pads and an all new drum brain, which sold for about 300 pounds. The pads weren't the best, but the system's strong point was was the drum brain, which was decently powerful at its price. It allowed you to create a lot of different sounds via a filter mode, which let you set six switchable signal sources to the filter section. From there, you had a host of different controls to experiment and manipulate the sound. 1984 Paragon Percussion Systems. This company was a short-lived Simmons lookalike. The Paragon Systems DVMX module sold for about 225 pounds. The first version came with two pads and a two-channel drum brain. A review at the time comparing it to the clone dual percussion synthesizer was not very kind. You were stuck with only one variant of white noise, no filter section, and one waveform. No modulation is available either, so bell and metal tones are out of the question. When you consider the retail price of the brain in two pads without a stand is 250 pounds, I feel like the unit at the moment must be seen as overpriced in relation to the competitors like Clone. Time will tell which of these two products actually have its marketing strategy right. Tony Reed, Electronic Sound and Computer Music Magazine. A later more expanded full-size Paragon drum set would be sold with four channels, the Model 100-A. 1984 was the year that MPC started making electronic drum sets. They sold a series of drum modules to power these new drum pads. The pads were 10 inches across and an inch and a half deep. The plain surface was a tough polyvinyl pad. All the pads were identical, even the kick drum pad. These were fairly inexpensive, they didn't use quarter inch cables, but instead a mini cannon connector. There were different drum brains offered this year, the DSM-1, the DSM-2, and the DSM-8+. The interesting thing about the DM-8 Plus Autotom was that if you struck one pad once, it would play a whole drum fill. You could adjust how long the fill was and how the pitch changed on each hit. And remember the MPC-1? Well, in 1984, the company released an add-on package called Live Pads. You'd buy this trigger box and then a set of drum pads that would be controlled by the MPC-1. In 1984, Simmons released the SDS-7. This was a five-piece kit that listed for 2,156 pounds or $4,365 in the United States. For years, this was the top of the line, best electronic drum set that money could buy in the 80s. The drum set featured Simmons' third iteration of their pads. They were more sensitive and also had better playing surfaces. 
The Drum Brain was a large rack mountable unit with a screen on the front and the ability to save kits that you created. You could also buy simple add-on modules for the Brain as well. The SDS-7 Drum Brain was a large step up over the SDS-5. You could store 99 kits and you had a lot of tone editing options at your disposal. You could also buy this add-on selector pad which let you switch between kits with a hit of your drumstick. First of all, can you explain to me this pad, the one you didn't hit? Yes, I can. This, this avoids a lot of knob twiddling over on the main unit, mm. which you're leaning on. Sorry about <laughs> that. I'll get back. Tell and, me. And allows me uh, my choice of 16 drum sets, which um, we've taken from the main unit, which draws 99. Right, and that's 16 choices per pad, I guess. Yes, it is, and I can recall them just by pressing like so. This was also a hybrid drum brain of sorts because not only did you have analog sounds at your fingertips, you also had samples that you could work with. This was very rare in 1984. It was described as mainly digital with analog strengthening by Simmons employees. Now this kit has got both analog and digital sounds and they're all programmable. Uh, so this snare drum for instance is purely a digital sample but I can drastically alter it just by turning one parameter down here Tom 1 is totally analog. Tom 2, a mixture of analog and digital with some click and noise thrown in. Tom 3 is... Weird. This year, Simmons also made a cheaper kit called the SDS-8 that year, which listed for about $1,550. With this drum brain, they used long rows of knobs instead of the digital dial and screen on the SDS-7. One author described the SDS-8 as like an updated, simplified, and low-cost version of the SDS-5. Simmons also made something called the SDS-EPB EEPROM blower. This was a device that let you record samples of your own drums and then input them inside of the drum module. This worked if you had an SDS-7, 1, or 9. The sample time could be up to 3 seconds long, which was very good for the day. This little unit here, called a sampling unit, actually samples acoustic sounds and blows the proms so that we can use any sound now for, for, for percussion. and not limited to drum-like sounds anymore. And of course we could sample a sound now if you're, you're game for it. Oh, I'm, I'm game for anything. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the obligatory dog. <laughs> <laughs> Chihuahua. Oh, that's beautiful. That, I'm getting really creative today. I'm not only an artist, I'm a singer. There was also an updated version of the Simmons Claptrap called the Simmons Digital Claptrap. And finally, in a trend that we've seen several times already, Simmons released the SDS-1 pad. This pad was an all-in-one battery-powered design. Unfortunately, it still had the super hard plane surfaces of the older style Simmons pads. You could buy this pad in red, white, or black. And if you wanted to change the sounds, you would have to swap out the EEPROM chip. It listed for $365. MPC released a bunch of new stuff in 1984. They came out with the DSM 32X4 module that could store 128 drum samples and it sold for about 300 pounds. The drum pads were also redesigned to make them look more like Simmons pads because customers asked them to do it, which is kind of like telling Ford that you need to make your cars look like BMW because they look cooler but whatever, the company did it. There was also the bug acoustic triggers from MPC. Something that should be mentioned is that at some point in electronic drums history, the word bug became interchangeable with the word drum triggers that go in drum heads. A lot of companies would use the word bug in their branding, like the Simmons drum bug in 1988, the JT Enterprises drum bug in 1986, and the MPC drum bug here in 1984. All right, let's talk about Seabro. I don't really know why, but this drum set really reminds me of an alien spaceship or maybe just a collection of 10 inch stainless steel frying pans. The Seabro gig machine sold for a modest 500 pounds and they were kind enough to include wooden cases for all the pads because they would ship this to you. The drum brain had five channels and I could only find one review from International Musician and Recording World magazine. Essentially, it was seen as a no-nonsense, inexpensive, and good-sounding drum set for the time, just with an odd look. This drum set must be very rare because it is hard to track down a modern video of someone actually playing it or even cases of it being sold on eBay. 1984 was also the year that Maxim hit the scene with the MDS 500 drum brain, which sold for a hefty $1,895 Australian. There was also the MDS-1000, which sold for $2,695 Australian. You could also find this drum set sold as the Suzuki Roadworks SD700. So I guess Yamaha isn't the only motorcycle company to sell electronic drums. This drum brain was huge and had a unique modular design with XLR pad inputs. I can only assume that with all of these removable plates, the drum brain was probably designed to be expanded if you wanted to add on more pads. The pads were all five-sided and kind of just looked like many electronic drums of the day. 
They also made a new drum brain the next year called the MDS-002. Believe it or not, Akai got into the electronic drum game for about half a second. The Akai AM10 digital memory cushion was an all-in-one drum pad that could be used as a snare, tom, or even mounted as a kick drum. It was shown at NAMM, but I don't think it was ever released. It looks very, very similar to the Drum FX2, which came out the following year. I'm not going to be following the different Akai releases from year to year in this video, but I should probably mention that Akai was used as the primary sound source of a lot of different electronic drum sets by early electronic drummers. This was usually done by connecting the MIDI out of the drum module into the MIDI in on the back of one of the Akai samplers to trigger sounds. And some of the Akai samplers actually had trigger inputs for drum pads, so you could use it as a drum module or a drum brain. So while Akai never made a full electronic drum set, they've been using different Akai drum brains with third-party drum pads for years. Okay, so now on to something that I actually own. This year, Tama released the Tama Techstar TS500 drum set. This sold for about $1,300 in the United States or $930 in the UK. The TS600 kit cost about 990 pounds. The construction of these pads is pretty simple as you can see from this teardown video that I did a while back. There's a plastic body. There's a couple of foam squares that hold a wooden plate. Underneath the wooden plate is a humongous piezo. Over top of that is a layer of foam. And then finally, a 12 inch acoustic drum head. I've also tried using a mesh drum head with this and it works fine, but to be honest, it doesn't really change the feel or really the volume of playing on this. You're basically playing on a piece of wood that has a layer of foam on top of it. It's loud, but not the loudest pad of the era. I'll be doing a dedicated breakdown of a bunch of different classic era electronic drum pads and show the volume comparison, all the different zones and all that stuff in a separate video because I have recently purchased a lot of classic era electronic drums. One review at the time of manufacturing was fairly positive, just with minor complaints about the snare and kick sounds not being quite as cool sounding as the Simmons drum brains and also the higher noise level. So next up is a really, really interesting drum set. This is the Pearl Fightman FM50 and FM80. The list price was about $770. There's a few notable things about this drum set. These are probably the first ever circular electronic cymbals. We wouldn't see this again until about the 1990s. I believe these are the first electronic hi-hats on a stand as well. The snare and floor tom were 10 inches across and the toms and kick drum were eight inches across. It used acoustic heads over a rubber pad on the inside. I found some new photos on a reverb listing. Here it is sitting in a music store and it doesn't look out of place at all. This kit from 1984 looks like every Alesis drum set from 2008. The only real downside was the drum brain. Comparing it to Simmons, it wasn't quite as sonically versatile. So one review at the time mentioned that it was great for live use, but maybe less so for studio work. Honestly, the drum set was ahead of its time, but unfortunately, Pearl didn't see it that way. Pearl went a completely different direction with a new drum set the very next year. 1984 Emu. Based on the Clavia DP1, this pad is the Emu Digital Percussion Module. E-drum list price was about 300 bucks. This was a square standalone pad that was meant to be used as an add-on to an acoustic drum set. Roland under the boss name would make something very similar about two years later. This pad had the advantage of swapping out sounds on a cartridge, so you could get clap, cymbal, piano, timpani, gong, snare, kick, and metal sounds. In 1984, Clavia released an improved version of the previous pad they'd come out with in 1983. This time it could play four sounds from an EEPROM chip, and it was released under the new D-Drum brand name with that now signature red color. Another short-lived brand from 1985 was Emerald. Wait, no, they decided to change it. Now it's the Benz DXL 6000. This drum set came out in 1985 for about $700 in five colors. The whole drum set kind of had a unique deep circular pad design. In 1985, Tama's next kit was the TAK 500. It came in black or white. And the biggest look difference was the kick drum, which had turned into a square. And they also redesigned the drum brain. Let's move ahead to what Pearl was doing this year. Like every company that first tried an acoustic looking electronic drum set in the 80s, Pearl decided to conform to the times and created the DRX-1 kit. This drum set sold for about 1,000 pounds, and it died right away, and was immediately followed up by the Pearl Drum X kit that same year. It turns out that Simmons was possibly going to sue Pearl for making what essentially was a clone of their kit, at least in the looks department. So Pearl changed the look of the drum set a little bit, and also the module a little bit, to avoid problems. The company Simmons was selling a ton of drum sets to famous bands left and right, and you could find their kits literally everywhere. So companies did what companies do. They copy the thing that's selling the best. Simmons was not happy about this, and what I'm guessing the whole situation boiled down to was here's a big drum company, and they wanted to make an example of them to scare off the smaller copycats. But anyway, going back to the Pearl Drum X, the magazines at the time seemed to like the new version. 
It had a decent feel and a competitive price. That same year saw the introduction of the Clavia D-Drum rack system. This set came with acoustic drum heads and rims. The drum brain was pretty large with a modular design. It could have up to eight individual modules. In original production batches, they were great, but later changed to the now well-known D-Drum red color. The kick drum was a strange post design that ended up in a small rubber square. Following the natural evolution of every electronic drum company from the dawn of time, Ultimate Percussion released an all-in-one drum pad with the drum brain built into the bass. The controls you had on this synth were Decay 1, VOC Sweep, VOC Pitch, Balance of Noise to VOC, Noise Filter, and Bite, or Click. The output was XLR. Bob Hernett, a reviewer at the time, called the sounds rich, thick, and strong with an aggressive edge. The 1UP was battery powered, came in black or white, and left or right-handed versions. It was about 22 centimeters across, and there was also a kick drum variant of the pad. So this means you could have built an entire drum set out of these all-in-one pads, but in the end, it would have made the drum set about 12% more expensive than a standard Ultimate Percussion kit. So it wasn't really worth it or meant to do that. Drumfire is a company that never really came out with a full drum set, but they did release several modules over the years, including the DF-282, the DF-584, and the Drumfire DF-2085, which came with two drum pads. It also sold under the Korn name. In 1985, the acoustic drum company Premier released the Power Pack. The drum brain was five channels and was one of the first drum modules or drum brains to have a metronome built in. The drum rack had a unique U-shape with drum rack pieces that held square pads, all while keeping room for adding acoustic cymbals if you wanted them. The finish on the drum rack was the same type you'd use on bike frames. And with a list price of 800 pounds, it wasn't really competing with the high-end electronic drum sets at that time. It was a little bit more towards the budget category. This drum set is pretty rare because only a few hundred were produced. In 1985, Honky Tonk Music created the Clone Multi-Clone, which they sold for about two years. This is a five-channel drum brain that was meant to be used with drum pads or triggers. And unfortunately, after those two years of this being produced, this is the last clone product that I could find. Clone as a company probably ended somewhere around 1987. 1985 also saw a sequel to the Cactus Desert Drums, called the Cactus Desert Drums Mark II. This drum set was very similar to the original Cactus Desert Drum set. The most apparent difference is cosmetic. They kept the same drum brain for the most part with a few minor tweaks. They changed the position of the headphone jack and level dial and a different connector for the PL11 slot. But the main difference here is the new pads. The front plate of the kick drum had a completely different design which some say looked a little bit more professional, but I kind of liked the older look because it was a little bit quirky. In one review of the kit, there weren't any complaints about the build of this drum set or the kick drum moving anymore, but just slight mentions of a little bit of crosstalk and complaints about the looks. Its main strength appeared to be in the sounds department of the drum brain, just like with the old version of the kit. Let's have a moment of silence for MPC because in 1985, they died a quiet death just three years after launch. Unfortunately, they couldn't even get rid of their remaining stock after selling everything off at a discount. The head designer, Clive Button, would go on to make the DSM module under the Icon Designs brand name, but the company MPC was gone. Rest in peace. Welcome to this demonstration of a real alternative to the acoustic drum kit, the Simmons SDS-9, an instrument which can perfectly emulate the sounds and control of a conventional kit, yet has the power to take the art of the drummer to new heights. Check out the SDS-9 at your nearest Simmons dealer and give yourself the edge. In 1985, Simmons released their flagship SDS-9 at a price tag of about $2,000. That's their suggested retail price. The drum set featured Simmons' first dual zone snare and MIDI functionality, which was a huge deal at the time. In at least one store, the drums would sell out before the shipments even began to arrive. This is also the same year that Simmons would introduce a bunch of other drum sets. The SDS-200, 400, and 800 lines. These were the new budget Simmons drum sets that were an attempt to offer a cheaper line of electronic drums to ward off the endless supply of copycat electronic drum companies that were popping up at that lower price range. The lower the number, the fewer pads, and the smaller the drum module, but they were all sort of based on the same sort of concept. In the US and Canada, these drums were sold as the CB700. This kit, in fact, is connected to this MIDI junction box, which does effects and sequences, which is in turn MIDI to the uh, tune percussion synthesizer down here so that I can get all sorts of tunes and sequences and echo effects like this. Mm -hmm. 
electronics had considered themselves just rhythm specialists, you know. I think that's becoming a fairly luxurious point of view, and I think drummers are increasingly interesting themselves in melody and harmony. And the new technology gives you control over those things. Um, I am playing a Simmons SDS-9, which is a basic drum setup here, which is midded to this guy here, which is now a board synthesizer, allowing me to produce a lot of the pitches and sounds that you hear. Um, I'm also playing a Simmons SDS-7 here, which provides 12 channels worth of interesting sound. The whole lot is wired into this genius little thing here called the MTM, which is a sort of elaborate routing device. And then that talks to, uh, it sends messages to all the units to turn up with certain programs at certain times. This unit here will allow me to store a hundred odd programs of anything I like, any combination of any of these instruments, with or without drum sounds, with or without certain pads. Any pad can be any sound at any time, in any combination, all storable in here where it says play patch. Now it says I'm going to play patch 17. For the purposes of this demonstration, we'll just see what on, is on 17. As you can tell, there's actually no drum sound there at all. But there are uh, two notes, dual layer it's called. You can see as I play it harder, come the pitches. This year, DW came out with a kick drum pedal trigger called the DW EP1. It was basically a modified DW5000 kick drum pedal, but with a rubber kick drum pad at the base. This is a style that Roland and many other companies would adopt and copy in coming years. There was also the EPR and EPN variants. 1985 seemed to be the year that everybody started making electronic drums, including Roland with the introduction of the Roland Alpha Drum System or more commonly referred to as the DDR30 drum set. This drum set features the very heavy rack-mountable DDR30 drum brain. This used PCM voices, and there was also an M16C expansion memory card to add 64 more sounds. The Roland Alpha kit was also MIDI equipped. This drum set featured a pad shape very similar to what Ultimate Percussion was using back then. Even back in 1985, Roland was using a naming scheme very similar to what they still use today. This drum set included the PD-10 and the PD-20 pads. I believe these were single zone, and they had quarter inch and XLR connections. But even more importantly in 1985, Roland released the Pad 8 Octopad, which sold for about 400 pounds. Roland originally planned on calling it the MPC-8, which would have caused a headache because of all the different MPC lines out there. This was a MIDI controller multipad that didn't come pre-installed with sounds of its own. You'd have to use it with a MIDI equipped drum machine or drum brain. The Octopad was a big deal for Roland. They sold a lot of them, and competitors took notice. Believe it or not, back in the 80s, I think Roland was actually known more for the Octopad than their full drum sets. One of the more interesting looking systems of the day was the LIS 8050 PC. With rubber pads inside of wooden casings, this drum set really stood out. The drum brain had 80 sounds and was 5 channels. They also released the D10, which was similar to the AD50 in terms of features, but was rack mounted and could only power one pad. In 1985, the Shark electronic bass drum pedal was introduced. A couple of famous drummers that used it were Phil Collins and Alan White. This was a unique design that had rollers that smoothly triggered a kick drum sound as you pressed down on the pedal. The Shark 2 came out next year and was known to be used by Rick Allen of Def Leppard. These pedals still have a bit of a cult following. A lot of people love these things. 1986 was a really big year for Dynacord. Dynacord decided to kick its drum module game up a notch with the brand new Dynacord Add One module. That stood for Advanced Digital Drums. Dynacord worked with the American company Fast Forward to produce this. The new Add One module was a massive upgrade in terms of features and storage capacity. This drum brain had a lot of things going for it. You just had more sounds at your disposal than most other drum brains gave you access to. Also, those sounds could sustain for a long amount of time. This made cymbals just sound better because they could ring out naturally. There were also lots of effect controls that you just didn't have access to before. You could also import your own samples if you got the floppy disk drive. The drum brain had trigger buttons on front so you could also audition sounds without hitting the drum pads. And as you can see, this thing was huge. Dynacord also produced a bunch of new drum pads at this time with that distinctive four-sided design that most of us associate with the Dynacord brand now. And one of these brand new drums was called the Duo Pad, which featured two zones for rim and head sounds. Reviewers at the time were pretty excited about this feature because it wasn't really widely seen in all electronic drums yet. 
There was also this brand new, strangely shaped drum rack called the Drum Caddy. But really, most of the attention that Dynacord got was for the drum module rather than the pads. All these improvements upped the price tag to about 3,000 pounds. And the floppy drive was extra on top of that. And of course, we can't forget about the rhythm stick. This is probably one of the strangest things that Dynacord made back in the 80s. This instrument had a plastic body and the shape of a guitar. You'd hit the triggers and then use the buttons on the neck to decide what sounds would be played from those hits. This was basically a keytar for drummers. It was invented by 19-year-old Pete Jones back in 1981 and then licensed to be distributed by Dynacord in 1986. The MIDI version was about 500 pounds and the non-MIDI version was 400 pounds. You can see the rhythm stick in the music video All of Me by Sabrina. Now, of course, this is a really interesting concept, but it never really caught on with drummers because of the aesthetic thing. To be honest, this kind of looks like a Guitar Hero controller. But of course, other people did like this. It did have its fans. But what is this thing called? It's called a rhythm stick. And basically, it's a drum machine. You sort of uh, play the rhythm with these two sensors down the bottom and change the pitch at the top, just like that. Just like that. I can hear a bit of it going on there. Could you give us, say, for instance, let's imagine for a moment that I was Stevie Wonder and I said, hmm, need a nice snare sound. What have you got? Snare sound. Fairly good. The inventor Pete Jones still retained the rights to this product and would later relaunch it back in the 90s, this time as JAMA. Pete Jones personally showed Michael Jackson how to play this thing. Apparently he's currently working on a new version of this as well, so we'll have to wait and see what comes out next. Under its Boss brand, Roland released the brand new Boss DRP line of pads, the DRP1, 2, and the BR1 pad. They didn't have any internal sounds, but was meant to be used with a drum module. All of these pads were about 200 bucks. Or if you buy one today at like a music go around, it looks like they're selling for about 70 bucks for two of them. That next year, Boss would make the MPD4, which was a MIDI controller version of the others. This concept kind of died off, but was later resurrected by Roland under the Roland SPD-1 brand name about 21 years later. One of the reviews at the time kind of pointed out what a lot of us think about the current Roland SPD-1 line. If you needed a certain sound, and one of those pads offered it, it could be a useful tool. The small form factor and the all-in-one design was great. But overall, you were still paying 200 bucks for about six sounds. In 1986, Pearl followed up the Fight Man, the DRX2, and the Drum X kits with its fourth entry, the Pearl Syncussion X kit. This was an eight-pad drum set with a module that looked like the one from the Drum X, but the SC40 had twice as many sounds. There was also the QP1 multi-pad expansion and a piece of hardware called the PE8 which let you plug in 16 total pads to the drum set, creating something like you would see in this little image right here. The cymbals on this drum set looked very unique for the time, and the whole kit sat on a drum rack with standard cymbal arms. Relying on a drum rack like this was something very unique for the time. Most companies were using individual stands. Unfortunately, by 1988, Pearl had discontinued their electronic drum line, according to Modern Drummer magazine. To be honest, this is something that Pearl has done time and time again throughout their history. They've never really been very consistent in their strategy. Okay, so what was Simmons up to in 1986? Well, they were still dominating the whole industry, as usual. 1986 saw the release of the Simmons SDS-1000, which was released for about $1,000 or £650. It was called the first truly creditable budget-priced electronic drum set by Music Maker magazine. This drum set was kind of like a better version of the Simmons SDS-800, but also a cheaper version of the SDS-9, but selling for about a thousand bucks less. Possibly the only real compromise was the single zone snare drum. And for some reason, they didn't include stands or a drum rack this time, but they would sell you one for about a hundred pounds extra. The first variant of this module didn't have MIDI functionality, but later versions called the 1000M did. The module was rack mounted like the Roland DDR30, a much different form factor for Simmons, and it featured a combination of analog and drum sampled sounds. Reviewers back in 1986 and 1987 absolutely loved this kit. Simmons also released the Trigger MIDI interface called the TMI this year as well. So now on to a brand that's known for its keyboards. Casio dipped its toe in the water of electronic drums with the Casio MIDI electronic drum system. This set of circular pads sat on a drum rack which also housed the RZ1 digital sampling drum composer. Unfortunately, this only had 12 sounds, but it did have the capacity to allow drummers to sample in their own sounds, but only four of them. Casio then made the DZ-1 MIDI drum translator, essentially a trigger interface that allowed you to connect this to a drum machine or drum module. It was a very simple system that competed mainly with Roland's PM-16, 
but at about half the price. As you'd expect with a Casio product, it was very simple. It didn't have features like MIDI in, velocity curves, gate time, layering, and it only had about eight inputs. But that let him price it incredibly cheap at a suggested retail price of about $230. While a very short-lived system, this drum set had a unique design language of its own that set it apart from the rest of the available kits at the time. There was also the DP1 multipad that had two zones and was released the following year. As you've probably noticed, Casio no longer makes electronic drums, except for the odd Casio stamped Medelli multipad on Amazon. But in general, they stopped making electronic drums in the 80s. Rest in peace, Casio. In 1986, Yamaha released the Yamaha D8 drum set. The MIDI pad interface was the PTX8. This drum set featured black, green accented teardrop shaped pads. The playing surface was made of rubber, thank goodness. For the pads, you got the PSD8 dual zone snare and PTT toms and the PBD8 kick drum pad which had a softer rubber playing surface than the other pads. It featured the PTS-8 percussion tone generator, which had eight inputs, MIDI in, out, and through, and there was also a foot switch input. Even though it was a dual zone snare, one reviewer at the time complained that when he hit the snare, it would trigger both zones at the same time, even after module adjustments. And also the MIDI functionality was limited because it couldn't do dynamic note shifts or MIDI mode message changes. But overall, it wasn't a bad drum set for the price. This company bought a ton of magazine ads to push this system. They threw their market weight behind it and it had a suggested retail price of about $1,800. In 1986, Worsi released the CX-5 Drum Composer. To complete the set you'd need the pads, the CX-5, and a Worsi pad interface. The CX-5 was MIDI compatible and used sound cartridges. The pads themselves were kind of like this unusual rounded square shape. In 1986, JT Enterprises would release their bug drum triggers. Each one costed about 50 bucks and sat on the drum head of your acoustic drum. Other triggers that kind of looked similar back then were the Filtech triggers in 87, the Fisherman acoustic drum trigger ADT model 100 in 88, the Drastic Plastic Triggers in 1988, that's a fun name to say. And finally, Trigger Perfect had a few designs, the SC-10 and the DT-1, in around 1986-1987. You can still see Trigger Perfect design triggers in Pintech drum sets to this day. 